heavy. Hmm. Welcome to Black Perspectives in Contemporary America. Uh, let me first <clears throat> mention some things about the rest of the program this week and this weekend. Tomorrow afternoon, beginning at 12, from 12 to 3, Professor Michael Deanong will be presenting a cultural arts workshop in the gallery room of the Memorial Union. Professor Deanong is the chairman of the Department of African and Afro-American Studies at the State University of New York at Brockport. He will also be speaking tomorrow night, also in the gallery room. Uh, his topic will be linkages in the black pluriverse. Also tomorrow afternoon, between the hours of 12 and 3, for you jazz lovers, there will be some taped music playing in the maintenance shop. And you may wish to take that in along with uh, some of the beer and wine and other things that they have down there, OK? On Saturday morning, students that participated in the SPAN program uh, this past summer who traveled to uh, Western Africa will be <clears throat> conducting a discussion of their experiences with overseas travel um, this past summer on that part of the African continent. They departed the United States, I believe, around July the 3rd. So they will probably also have some interesting insights to share with us about their perceptions of the bicentennial period uh, from abroad, uh, reactions uh, that they had uh, to the bicentennial there, and also their experiences um, uh, with the people of that country. At that time, the Angolan situation was pretty a pretty big thing. So that ought to be a very interesting discussion. Saturday morning, also in the gallery room, that will be at 10 o'clock from 10 to 12. Our speaker for tonight <coughs> was born in Kansas City, Missouri. He took his BA from the University of Kansas at Lawrence in chemistry and his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He has been a consulting editor for Harper and Row magazine special consultant to OEO for Upward Bound. He has been chairman of the Minority Student Education Commission at the University of Maryland, College Park. He is a member of the Assembly of Behavioral and Social Sciences of the National Research Council, a member of the Board of Directors of the Carver Research Foundation at Tuskegee Institute, an honorary member <coughs> Phi Beta Kappa and Phi Lambda Upsilon, he is currently the principal investigator for a grant titled Gene Location in the Interferon System. His topic for tonight will be Trends in Genetic Research Implications for People. I might also mention that there will be a reception following this presentation and question and answer session at the Black Cultural Center that's at 517 Welch Avenue. Would you please welcome Dr. Richard Goldsby. Thank you. I want to thank Mr. Taplin for that introduction and for a very pleasant day here at Ames, Iowa. It's a real pleasure to come to Ames because as a member of the Carver Research Foundation of the Tuskegee Institute, we realized that it was here at Ames long before people started affirmative action programs long before that notion would even have been viably floated in the United States, that uh, the Iowa State University uh, took George Washington Carver in, uh, gave him the splendid intellectual development that allowed him to make the superb discoveries that he made at the Tuskegee Institute. And, and we are indeed grateful to you here at Iowa State for giving Dr. Carver his start. We're also impressed with the fact that you have seen fit to honor Dr. Carver's memory uh, by uh, dedicating uh, a building to him and so naming such a building. And I was pleased to learn from a student today that uh, democracy is very much alive uh, in Ames, Iowa, and that you've had um, a plebiscite 
uh, here at the Iowa State University where you have discussed the naming of that magnificent uh, new football plant uh, that you have over there and that uh, the community here at Ames uh, has voted to honor uh, yet another uh, black American that the university here at, at, the, at Ames, uh, the Iowa State University, uh, saw fit to honor long before it was fashionable to so to do and that you have voted uh, to name that the Thai Stadium. I'm indeed grateful to be in such a forward-looking institution. Now, I'm also grateful that my good friend uh, and superb geneticist, uh, Jody Stadler, uh, has come out tonight and uh, she will act as, as referee tonight and uh, if I uh, if I make any, uh, any missteps and so forth, I have great confidence, having seen Jody in action in other situations, that she will straighten things out. Now, what I'd like to do this evening, basically, is talk about three things. I want to talk about genetics. I want to talk about genetics at the molecular level, at the cellular level, and also at the population level. And I hope, trust, have great faith that some of the things I say tonight are going to be controversial. And so I hope that after uh, I finish filibustering here, that there'll be some good discussion and we'll get into these issues to some extent. Now, let's, um, let's start off by, by telling the parable. And uh, like all good parables, this parable will have a moral. And I'll share with you at the end. This is the parable of the sheep farmers. Once upon a time, there were a group of sheep farmers who lived in England also with sheep, sheep farmers who lived in South Africa. And the sheep farmers that lived in England had a prized ewe that produced superior wool and produced lambs whose meat was also of superior quality. Uh, the sheep farmers that lived in South Africa had a superior ram to produce uh, uh, offspring that had superior wool and also produced lambs of superior quality. Now the obvious thing to do was to get the ram from South Africa and the ewe from Britain together and let nature take its course and get a lot more offspring that would have all of these fine and superior qualities. The only problem is that when you have superior animals of this sort, you don't like them to travel great distances. You don't like people traveling, but you really don't let a superb piece of livestock of that sort get on something as dangerous as an airplane and fly more than 7,000 miles between South Africa and Britain. So the ram and the ewe, alas, were kept in genetic isolation. Now, someone got a bright idea. Having read the literature of genetics, they found out that it was possible to take eggs from a female uh, by injecting the female with hormones, which cause ovulation. So they injected the ewe with hormones that cause ovulation. They then solicited a sperm sample from the ram in South Africa. It's a lot safer to send the sperm than it is to send the ram. So the sperm sample was sent. The sperm in the test tube, and of course test tubes, that's a, that's a poetic license, if you will. It wasn't done with test tubes at all. It was done with petri dish. Uh, the sperm and the eggs were mixed in England. The petri dish, an appropriate medium. Fertilization took place. A zygote was formed. And this zygote was quickly popped into the uterus of a rabbit. The rabbit, of which there are many, were loaded onto, uh, uh, was loaded onto a jet plane. This jet plane was flown to South Africa. The rabbit was taken off the jet plane, killed, probably eaten, and the developing uh, embryo was then implanted into the uterus of just an ordinary sheep. And of course, you know the way they picked the sheep to put the uh, developing embryo into. The farmer went out to the flock and said, I think I'll choose you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so the, uh, the, developing, the developing embryo was put into the into just an ordinary ewe, not a very valuable ball, but he would shear it anyway. And some months later, healthy sheep were born. So this is a scheme for getting prize livestock together that works. And the moral of the story, of course, is obvious. And that is, sheep don't have to sleep to produce more sheep. <laughs> and uh, the other moral story is that it's true. This with technology that has been done, this can be done now. So it's possible, using the techniques of genetics today, to breed farm animals at a distance and to use some animals as surrogate mothers. This is a genetic technology that one can and has put into effect now. 
So the technique of surrogate motherhood is one that the science of genetics has mastered and is able to put into effect now. There was a claim during 1974 by a Dr. Brevis of England that he had presided over three human births in which sperm from a father was taken and mixed with eggs in a petri dish from a mother and re-implanted into a surrogate mother and successfully uh, brought to term. Uh, it turns out that since 1974, uh, Dr. Brevis has not indicated uh, who those individuals were, and other people have not been able to duplicate this feat that was reported by Dr. Brevis. So even though it's true for sheep, uh, at the present reading, it's not documented for human beings. But there's no reason, no theoretical reason, to think that someday this technology might not also be applied to human beings. Whether or not it will be applied is, of course, another question. But one could imagine a scenario where, as things develop, fortunately, having three daughters, I'm delighted to see that now women are looked on as human beings, too. And since they're looked on as human beings, it's uh, conceded uh, that uh, women ought to have the same opportunities for personal and professional development that men have. So one can see a couple of, of people meeting here at Iowa State, uh, one uh, uh, an economics major, uh, the other an anthropologist, uh, meeting and deciding uh, to establish a living arrangement with each other. But uh, since her profession requires her to be in the jungles of New Guinea and his requires him to be at an office of the World Bank in London, they find it rather difficult to have children via the natural or the usual means. Anything that happens in nature, of course, can't be unnatural. So I should say but you have to have children by the usual means. So he goes to a suitable physician in, in, in London and deposits a sperm sample. Uh, she goes to a somewhat closer center in Australia, deposits some eggs uh, uh, in, in, in a nice, clean, well-lighted place somewhere in the globe. These sperm and eggs are put together. Uh, a suitable surrogate mother is, is, is retained, probably from, 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 the, uh, from the unemployment rolls, uh, so as to alleviate a social problem in the process. And then nine months later, they both receive telegrams uh, telling them and describing in some detail their offsprings, perhaps, either, perhaps even a, a picture via wire photo. But uh, one can see the miracles of uh, modern technology uh, allowing uh, people to live apart, live their own lives, lives follow their own careers, and uh, have children uh, while doing the same sort of thing. So the possibility of surrogate motherhood exists. Uh, it can be applied to agricultural pursuits. Maybe someday it'll be applied to human beings. Now, another technology, another genetic technology I'd like to talk about is the cloning of organisms. Uh, some years ago, a superb uh, developmental biologist, John Gurdon, who works in England and is English, uh, decided for reasons that couldn't possibly be aesthetic that it might be interesting to duplicate Xenopus uh, by an unusual means. Now, Xenopus is uh, the South African clawed toad, and it's probably one of God's ugliest creatures. Uh, it comes into the world, no treat to the eye, and as each day passes, it gets almost unbelievably even uglier than it was when it came into the world. Now, uh, what John Gurdon has done is the following sort of experimental protocol. What he does is he takes an egg from a xenopus, fertilizes it, and you know eggs come in two parts. An egg is a cell, and a cell has two parts. It has a nucleus and a cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is there to support the nucleus, and what the nucleus does is the nucleus contains hereditary information, the same stuff that makes cats have kittens. That's in the nucleus, the DNA. And it's the informational blueprint that tells the organism everything it should do, as modified by environmental influences, of course. So what John Gurdon does is to take this egg and take the nucleus out. And in normal circumstances, that would be the end of the ball game. But it's not, because what John Gurdon does is John Gurdon takes an adult frog, goes into the intestine of that adult frog, gets a nucleus by microsurgery from one of the cells in the intestine, and puts it into this enucleated egg. And then in some of the cases, what happens is these enucleated eggs that have received now these nuclear transplants go on through an orderly process of development and produce tadpoles. And these tadpoles are the identical twins, the identical genocopies 
of the frog uh, from whom the nucleus was taken. And it's possible to do this once, or twice, or five times, or a dozen time, times, or dozens of times. So it's possible to take one organism and make an indefinite number, an indefinite but large number, of precise genetic copies of that organism. And that is the technique of cloning. It's a way of duplicating useful genotypes in organisms. And you can immediately imagine uh, the implications of this kind of discovery for agriculture. Uh, it should be possible, once the technology has been mastered for mammalian species, to take eggs from one mammal, take a nucleus from another mammal of the same species, implant it into that egg, and get it to develop into a genocopy of that same organism. What that means is if you have a prize bull, it would be possible to get any number of prize bulls. If you had a prize cow, a cow that produced an enormous amount of milk, and milk production is one of those things that's strongly genetically determined, it would be possible to get whole flocks of these cows in a single generation via this cloning technique. Their course is only one hitch, and the hitch is that this cloning technique has been very thoroughly worked out for frogs' eggs, which are about 10 times larger than the eggs of a mammal. Because they're 10 times larger, you can do the kind of microsurgery that's required in order to practice this sort of technology. In the case of mammalian eggs, they're so small that one can't do the microsurgery satisfactorily to accomplish this kind of nuclear transplantation and get the nucleus to develop a new organism. So at present, uh, the idea of cloning mammalian species uh, is an idea on the drawing board. It's reality for amphibians, but it's something that is imagined as being possible for mammals. Uh, I personally have no doubt that with the course of research being what it is, the pace of research being what it is, that you're going to pick up a copy of your New York Times or your Des Moines Register one day, and you're going to find that cloning has been successfully practiced in mammalian species, and this is going to be a great boon to animal husbandry. I don't think we need worry terribly much about uh, these uh, uh, doomsday uh, scenarios we hear sketched out about the Shah of Iran having himself cloned hundreds of thousands of times and having an army of Mohammeds uh, attacking the world, more or less. I think this is a technology that will be used primarily uh, in animal husbandry. Now, the business of cloning in the past few years has been refined to an even greater extent. The business of cloning has been refined to the point that you may say, well, really, I don't want the whole organism. All I want is one of the genetic products from the organism. So wouldn't it be nice if I could throw away most of the organism and just keep the useful genes from that organism, just keep the DNA? And that's what the, gen that's what the genetic material is, as you know chemically. It's DNA. Just keep the particular uh, stretch of DNA that codes for particular products that you're interested in. It turns out that over the past three years or so, it has been possible to clone DNA. And let me tell you just very briefly about how that's done. Uh, there are bacteria that live in our intestines known as Escherichia coli, E. coli to its, its friends and its, and its lovers, you might say. Uh, e. coli has been called by uh, uh, Professor James Watson, uh, one of the world's three best known organisms. Uh, e. coli doesn't do terribly much in terms of causing disease, but it's probably given tenure to more people than any other single organism, and then it's probably the most published on organism uh, that we know of. Now, E. coli has a genome, as all organisms have, and it has, in addition to its basic genome, it has a sort of, in many cases, a sort of supernumerary genome called a plasmid, which is a smaller genome that exists in the cell, cohabits in the cell with the primary genome, if you will. And it turns out that through chemical methods, one can isolate plasmids very nicely. And E. coli, just as it duplicates its own genome, will duplicate plasmids that are present uh, within its cellular boundaries also. Now, it's possible to take a group of uh, cutting tools known as restriction enzymes and open up these plasmids in such a way that they will fit with another piece of DNA that's also been treated with restriction enzymes. Now, you can take DNA from any system, DNA from another E. coli bacterium, DNA from a Drosophila fly, DNA from a human being. Treat it with these re restriction enzymes so that it fits into the plasmid, 
mix it with the plasma, treat it with another enzyme that sews things up, a so-called ligase enzyme, and get whole new plasmids that are hybrid. They are hybrids of the original DNA present in the coli bacterium and the new piece of DNA that you put in. This is the so-called recombinant DNA. Now, if you put these pieces of recombinant DNA, just put them into the culture with Escherichia coli bacterium. The bacterium will take them up and will faithfully duplicate them. And what this means now is that where you put in one gene, when that gene goes into an Escherichia coli bacterium and that E. coli bacterium divides uh, over a number of generations to produce from that one bacterium hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, huge numbers of bacteria, you've also duplicated that piece of DNA hundreds of thousands, millions, trillions of times. So this is a way of cloning particular pieces of DNA that have genetic information uh, that have particular interest to the investigator or particular interest to society. And one of the suggestions is that what we might do is to take those DNA sequences that are involved in the production, say, of insulin uh, and put those into Escherichia coli bacteria. Uh, have the bacteria divide and duplicate the insulin sequences and make insulin bacteria, bacterial cultures, which could be used to treat diabetes. It's also been suggested that growth hormone, another rare substance that's very hard to get hold of, it's gotten hold of now by using either cadaver pituitaries or beef pituitaries to some extent, and one could perhaps put the genes for growth hormone into bacteria and make growth hormone in bacterial cultures. And there are a long list of useful products that one might be able to make uh, in bacteria through this technique of DNA cloning. Now, it turns out that experiments of the sort that I've been sketching out here just briefly are experiments that have uh, very dramatic social implications. They're scientifically dramatic experiments. And what you find is that often where there's high drama, uh, there's, of course, high conflict. And so the entire world has not greeted uh, this news from the genetic community uh, with equanimity. Uh, there are some people uh, who have had the temerity to suggest that there might be some dangers involved in this kind of work. And uh, some of these people are extremely uh, eminent as molecular geneticists, people like Robert Sinsheimer, people like Erwin Chargaff, people like George Wald, the Nobel laureate of Harvard University, have all spoken out against uh, dashing into this kind of research, especially the recombinant DNA type of research. And some of the arguments that have been advanced by these people who oppose this sort of research, especially the recombinant DNA type of research, are the following. First of all, they suggest that what science is doing is to intervene in the evolutionary process. Erwin Chargaff, in one of his characteristically uh, eloquent uh, statements, uh, in a letter to Science Magazine uh, said we have no right to meddle in evolution and that future generations will curse us for this meddling. They also say that what is being done in recombinant DNA research is to create new and wholly unnatural genetic combinations. And finally, they point out that this kind of research carries with it uh, the danger of loosing on the human population or on our domesticated plants or animals, a wholly new type of a disease-causing organism. And for these three reasons, primarily, uh, they indicate that there ought to be at least a moratorium on uh, recombinant DNA type research. And there are some people who suggest that this research probably should not even be done. As I said before, they say it's intervening in the evolutionary process. Uh, they say it's creating new and unnatural genetic combinations. And uh, you, sh you, you almost have an obligation as a social responsible citizen to read the arguments put forth by people like Chargaff and Sensheimer uh, in, uh, I think, in very ac accessible language uh, in Science Magazine during the past year. These are points of view with which uh, a number of members of the uh, genetics community and I myself do not agree. I think this kind of research ought to go forward with appropriate safeguards, and I don't think it represents uh, the breaking of conceptually new ground. For instance, I don't think it's new meddling uh, in the evolutionary process. I don't think anyone would argue that Noah took a dachshund on the ark with him or that he took any hybrid corn onto the ark with him. Uh, the dachshund and hybrid corn are, of course, 
holy creations of man's and woman's genetic meddling, if you will. They are laboratory creations. Uh, anybody who believes in animal breeding or in plant breeding believes in intervening in the evolutionary process. Uh, and uh, this is something that we do all the time. And uh, it, it doesn't represent new ground. Uh, I don't really feel that one would suggest that the mule represents a wholly natural uh, genetic combination. In the wild, uh, donkeys and horses, if they existed uh, in their present form, uh, wouldn't uh, uh, get together. Uh, the mule represents a rather unnatural, although very useful, uh, genetic combination. And of course, there are others we could think of as well. So I think that if appropriate safeguards are instituted, that probably recombinant DNA research can be prosecuted uh, with minimum of accidents. And I'm not altogether sure that one could argue that performing an experiment with recombinant DNA is inherently more dangerous than performing an experiment uh, in uh, somatic cell genetics where you hybridize cells of different species or going out into the Drosophila lab and putting together fruit flies that necessarily haven't been together before. I think uh, you might have to work pretty hard to say that one's more unnatural than the other turns out to be. The third point I would uh, throw out for discussion, and possibly for argument, uh, is to say that the likelihood of losing, uh, through this kind of research, a new disease-producing organism, so uh, I suspect are kind of remote. I say this for the following reasons. Uh, until very recently, uh, we did an awful lot of research in the United States, uh, in Britain, and in the Soviet Union, and some other parts of the world, in an area known as biological warfare, where the name of the game was to take a bacterium or a virus that you already knew could cause human disease and make it even more dangerous than it was, make it more virulent than it occurs naturally. And once you had succeeded in doing this in the laboratory, not to stop there, but to produce it by the pound, sometimes by the ton, and to store it. Uh, we did this. We stored huge amounts of these materials in l near Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I don't think that we record uh, pandemics being caused uh, by this deliberate attempt to make organisms that would be infectious and lethal for human beings in large quantities. I would suggest that in view of the fact that we've tried it on a large scale, and it hasn't spread over the earth, probably the kinds of laboratory strains that are likely to be used in the recombinant DNA research that people have in mind to conduct in P4 facilities, these are ultra-containment facilities, probably won't lose pandemics either. That's my opinion on the matter. Uh, those are my feelings on the matter. And I hope there'll be some discussion uh, about these experiments. Now, what I want to do is to turn from a discussion of cellular and molecular genetics to a discussion of population genetics. And uh, this is a discussion that I often have uh, with someone I've come to know rather well over the past couple of years, uh, a Professor William Shockley. And I think I'd probably call this part of the talk uh, the Shockley-Goldsby debates a one-sided view, since Professor Shockley isn't here in person uh, to present with his characteristic vigor uh, his uh, particular slants on the question that I'd like to uh, talk about during the next possibly uh, 20 minutes or so. And that's the question of the relationship between race and IQ. Now, this question exists today as a viable question primarily through the scholarly efforts of Professor Arthur Jensen of the University of California at Berkeley. In 1969, Professor Jensen published an article, a long article, 124 pages, in the Harvard Educational Review, which was entitled, How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement? Uh, in this rather closely reasoned and well-written article, uh, Professor Jensen pointed out that if one looks at the black population as a whole in the United States and the white population as a whole in the United States, one finds that the black population scores on IQ tests an average of 85, and the white population scores on IQ tests an average of 100. He then discusses the reasons behind the differences seen in black-white IQ test scores. 
And he concludes that these differences cannot be explained uh, substantially by environmental arguments, but their explanation uh, must lie in genetic differences between the two racial groups. And so the thesis of Professor Jensen is that the uh, smaller uh, uh, level of academic achievement, that the lower IQ scores uh, made by black populations are constitutional in origin, that they represent an inherent intellectual genetic deficit. And uh, the question that Professor Shockley and I debate is, uh, uh, are blacks less intellectually able uh, than whites? And you can probably uh, pre uh, guess what side of that question uh, I, I argue. Yes. Now, uh, Professor Shockley bases his arguments on statistical data gathered from a number of studies which demonstrate the black-white IQ difference, which I don't contest. It is there. 15-point uh, difference in your random sample of blacks and your random sample of whites, you'll duplicate it as often as you want to run the experiment. I don't really think that's arguable, okay? So I'm not even going to try and attack that information, but I think it's valid information. I think it's true. Uh, Professor Shockley also uh, cites uh, some animal studies of which he's particularly fond, and uh, we chat about these, and I was delighted to find, if we can have the first slide, that I'm not the only one who wonders about uh, the legitimacy of such studies. Let me move the podium away a little bit. So the Ed, and uh, the Wizard of Ed really did have something to say. Uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't totally blank. Uh, he, he points out that he, of course, set up the experiment knowing what the conclusions would be. And uh, of course, uh, 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 the white mice are all seeking uh, the uh, uh, the crime-free environment of suburbia. Um, so much for the slides for the present time. Um, so Professor Shockley and I uh, talk about this issue a great deal. And one of the points that I like to make during these conversations that we have uh, is that the IQ test isn't meaningless, as some of its detractors have claimed. Uh, if you take IQ test scores, you take a group of individuals who have high IQ test scores and a group who have low IQ test scores and look at their performances as groups, uh, what you find, certainly what the Army found, was that you can train people who have high IQs to do things such as fix trucks or learn languages more rapidly than you can train people who have low IQs to do those same things. That's another matter that seems to be uh, a matter of documented fact and it's not something with which I want to quarrel. Uh, IQ tests, after all, were designed originally by Binet to predict success or failure in school-type situations, and it really isn't surprising that that's precisely what they do, and they do do that. Uh, the thing that IQ tests don't do, necessarily, uh, is to predict who's going to be outstanding. Uh, for instance, you don't decide who's going to be President of the United States by giving an IQ test and putting the person in the White House who has the highest score. Uh, our sad political history certainly attests to that. Whereas we would certainly agree that uh, Mr. Ford is a bright man, uh, we, we might not feel that he's necessarily the brightest person in his administration. Mr. Kissinger might, for instance, be, be somewhat brighter than even Mr. even somewhat brighter than Mr. Mr. Ford. So uh, if, we want to, if we go to a bank and we want to determine who's president of the bank, uh, we don't walk through the door ask who had the highest IQ score, and then start talking to that person about getting a loan. Uh, that's not necessarily the president of the bank. We'd do much better to find out uh, who in the bank had a father who had previously been president of that bank. That's probably the best way to find out. It's genetically determined, all right, but not, not in the way that my good friend, <laughs> my good friends, Professor Shockley and Professor Jensen, like to think of it. Uh, there's another story I like to tell that illustrates the point very well, and that is the following story. And uh, you really want to worry about the accuracy of this story because it's really very, very damning for my opponent, Professor Shockley. Uh, during the 1930s, uh, Professor Terman of Stanford University decided that he wanted to determine the who, what individuals between the ages of oh, 15 and 20 were brightest in California. So he went up and down the state of California giving people IQ tests, and he picked out a thousand gifted individuals. He had a cutoff point of 135 on the IQ test. 
and he picked out a thousand individuals that he considered were the, the brightest high school students in California. And uh, he followed these individuals in a longitudinal study uh, through their lives. And it turns out that this group did extremely well. They did very well in college, and they have done well financially since graduating from college. They've done extremely well, I think you would say. That can't be taken away from the study done by Terman. However, there were a couple of individuals in the state of California that he tested and rejected as not being part of the cream of the crop. Uh, one of these individuals was a, a, a William Shockley, uh, who went on <laughs> to, uh, to finish a, a PhD at MIT, a demanding institution, and went on to invent the transistor that's improved and benefited all of our lives, made our lives richer, and has been rewarded for this accomplishment by the receipt of a Nobel Prize. None of the people in Terman's sample got a Nobel Prize. Well, after all, uh, uh, one swallow doesn't make summer, does it? Uh, well, it turns out there were two he missed, because he also tested Louis Alvarez, who won a Nobel Prize in physics, professor at Berkeley, uh, who was also rejected as not being uh, quite high enough on the IQ score to be included in the elite group that he selected. And I, my authority for this story is none other than Professor William Shockley. So I believe the story, and you should too. Uh, it, but it, what it tends to do is to put the IQ score, I think, in some kind of perspective. Another thing that puts the IQ score as a means of social policy, I think, in some sort of perspective, is to look at the history of mental testing and its relationship to social policy. The proposals of Professor Jensen and Professor Shockley to use mental testing to some extent to order our society are not new. The basic idea uh, was tried here in the United States many, many years ago. Uh, they were tried in the initial enthusiasm for mental testing that developed during the late teens and early 20s. Now, as most of you know, the United States has been the fortunate recipient of a number of waves of immigrants from other, uh, from, from, from other countries. And of course, uh, during the, uh, the early 1900s, the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, we were fortunate to be getting a number of immigrants from Eastern Europe, and a number of these immigrants were Jewish. Now, there were a lot of people in the United States who had been here a little longer, none, of course, as long as the original Americans, who had been here for maybe 15, 20,000 years, but they, of course, are immigrants, too. They crossed over from Asia on the land bridge maybe 20,000 years ago. So we are, in the truest sense of the word, a country of immigrants. Everybody came from somewhere else, it turns out. But uh, some people who had been here for maybe two or three generations before those Eastern European immigrants came and Southern Europe, European immigrants came got to worrying about this influx of what they felt were obviously inferior types. And so they resorted to mental testing to show that these people were inferior and to argue successfully, it turns out, in Congress that we ought to severely restrict the immigration from Southern Europe and from Eastern Europe. And on the, the next slide, what I'd like to show is a ranking made by these individuals on the basis of mental testing of who was bright and who was dumb. Now, um, it was very clear from studies done by Goddard and a number of others, Goddard's conclusions are truly representative of the conclusions drawn by the mentalists of that time. And what Goddard found was that Russians uh, were really the dumbest of all. Jews, of course, were close behind. They were really pretty stupid, uh, low mental types. Uh, Hungarians weren't very bright. And neither were Italians very bright. Well, a slide that my good friend, Professor Shockley, likes to show is one in which he castigates blacks for having so many children, some of them even out of wedlock. And he points out that Jews, and Russian Jews, that is, and Italians tend to have fewer children per family uh, than other groups do have. They have about two children per family. And they also have the highest educational levels and the highest per capita incomes in the United States. So you see that all of that um, kike and dago riffraff has now turned into the best educated and the highest income groups in the United States. Had it been left to Goddard, uh, we, of course, wouldn't have those people in the United States at all. 
Today they run the Bank of America. It's owned by the Giannini family, as you know. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, individuals who have a Jewish uh, heritage, of course, are well represented on the faculties of the country's universities and medical schools. You might even have a few here at Iowa State. Uh, it's sufficiently good university that I'm sure you have a number. Uh, so there have been abuses in the past of mental testing, and um, I think we can predict that if the ideas of Professor Jensen and Professor Shockley are instituted, uh, we might have abuses uh, in the present and in the future. If we can have the lights again, please. Uh, I'd like to move away from the kind of, oh, anecdotal, if you will, uh, disagreement, refutation of a weak sort of these ideas that we've been indulging in. And I'd like to present some hard data that disagrees uh, with the ideas advanced in Professor Jensen's article and the ideas advanced uh, by Dr. Shockley. Now, if you read Professor Jensen's article, and it is a very, very well-written article, and as I say, a closely reasoned article in which a great deal of data uh, is cited. I heartily recommend it to everyone who has an interest in this question. I also recommend some other reading to people who have an interest in this question, things like um, uh, Racial Differences, Race Differences in Intelligence uh, by Gardner Lindsay and his, co and his collaborators published by Freeman during 1975 is an excellent and dispassionate and objective view of this whole field. And I heartily recommend that you take a look at that also. Uh, of course, the thing I like most uh, is Race and Races, written by Richard Goldsby, but I don't think that's quite as dispassionate and quite as objective as Race Differences in Intelligence uh, by Lindsay and his collaborators. But there has been a study done by uh, Dr. Paul Nichols that takes a look at the relationship between uh, social economic status and performance on IQ tests. Now, in Professor Jensen's article, he points out that if you divide people into five social economic groups based on family income, you don't find that you can explain the difference in black-white IQ test scores on the basis of social economic differences. That just isn't enough in his analysis to account for it. What Paul Nichols has done is to make an extremely in-depth analysis of social economic factors, going much further than just the question of how much money does the family make, but asking such questions as who makes the money, are both individuals working to make it, what's the level of family education, where does the family live, even going into how many bathrooms there are in the house. And building up from this kind of data, very closely matched groups of blacks and whites that have been matched in depth for the social economic indices. And the thing that impresses me most about the Nichols study is that the data that he used, the primary data he used, was not gathered by people who had any interest whatsoever in the race IQ argument. It was gathered by the National Institutes of Health of the Institute of Neurological Diseases, Blindness, and Stroke that decided it would take a thoroughly Baconian approach uh, to deciding who might get a stroke. They figured that if you could get all of the information on people, all the information, you know, Francis Bacon said if you get all the information and analyze it, truth will emerge. What Francis Bacon didn't tell you was how to know when you had gotten all the information. But at any rate, the National Institutes of Health instituted a Baconian program to get all the information on a group of individuals Look at, that individuals, look at those individuals throughout life and see which ones got strokes and then correlate the getting of a stroke with certain things that might appear in the, that person's background when you would know what factors led to stroke. So they collected every bit of information they could in a number of cities across the country, including Philadelphia and Boston. And what they did was to record information on every 10th birth in a number of hospitals in Philadelphia and a number of hospitals in Boston, birth weight, uh, what the mother had in her diet, family income, where they lived, how many bathrooms they had, where the kid went to school, uh, kid's IQ at four years, kid's IQ at seven years, how tall the kid was at four years, just because they were things you could measure. They didn't really measure IQs because they had interest in IQ. It was just something else you could take a look at and put into a computer. But what Paul Nichols did was to write a computer program that matched, as I indicated, black and white populations in Philadelphia and Boston in an in-depth fashion for these socioeconomic variables. And if we take a look at the next slide, you can see 
what Paul Nichols found. And I really don't think that what Paul Nichols found is terribly surprising. If you take a look at this data, let's skip that and go on to the next slide, please. Uh, what you'll find is, looking at populations in Boston and populations in Philadelphia, you'll find exactly what you expect, that people in Boston are brighter than people in Philadelphia. <laughs> Why, the, uh, the average IQ of uh, people in Boston is above 100, and that in Philadelphia is below 95 or below. And uh, this doesn't surprise me one bit. Uh, I've spent a week in Philadelphia on many one-day visits. And uh, it's a terrible place, awful place. But what you find is that when you look, however, at the comparison between blacks and whites in Boston matched in depth for socioeconomic status, and these numbers aren't small, are blacks and whites in Philadelphia, you find that that 15-point difference you see when you observe random populations of blacks and whites, where we would all agree the in-depth socioeconomic match is a mismatch, what you find is when you match them very closely, that 15-point difference shrinks to five points or less, and nobody's going to write a 124-page article in the Harvard Educational Review about a five-point difference, okay? So there's some hard data from Professor Paul Nichols that you can read about in the 1973 Social Biology. Now, there have been other studies done that are also in the same direction that are published, and I'd like to share some of those studies with you also. Now, Dr. Sandra Scar Salopatic of the University of Minnesota has formulated the following hypothesis and tested it. She's hypothesized that maybe the reasons behind uh, the black-white IQ deficit uh, will be found in looking at the child-rearing practices of blacks and whites. Maybe that's where the differences come in. And so what she's done to test this hypothesis is to take a look at black youngsters who have been adopted into middle-class, middle-income, and upper-middle-income white families. And what she's found is the following that if you look at black children who, if reared by their natural parents, one can, from correlation coefficients, calculate, would have an IQ of 90 or so. 85 to 90 is the average IQ found in black children. And looking at the educational achievement, achievements of the parents, looking at the IQs of the parents, you can predict that these youngsters would have an IQ of 90 if raised by their natural black parents. You find that when they are transracially adopted by middle-class white families in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, you find they now turn in an average IQ score of 106, six points above the national average. Excuse me. So the conclusions from this study are really quite clear. You haven't changed the genes by this transracial adoption, but you've raised the average IQ by something on the order of 16 points by dramatically changing in depth from a very early period the environment. Now, just to demonstrate that uh, you can raise the IQs of black children without having them adopted into white homes, although I don't think there should be any prohibition or any discouragement of whites in adopting black, black children. I think that uh, we're more alike than we are different, and that the thing a child needs more than anything else is the love and care that someone who wants to be a parent can give, and I, for one, I'm not particular whether that parent is black or white. The thing that's important to me is that the parent can and does give the child the support and the love the child needs in order to succeed uh, in our society and in order to grow up into a whole human being. But if you look at the studies done by uh, Dr. Rick Heber and Dr. Garber of the University of Wisconsin, those are interesting studies that show it's possible to raise the IQs of black youngsters without the necessity of transplanting them into white homes. Now, what was done here was the following sort of thing. What they did was to suggest, just as Dr. Scar Salopatic did, that if you grow up in an environment that is intellectually marginal or below, in an environment that's economically marginal or below, that it's very difficult to uh, develop intellectually uh, up to the average level, and the average level isn't intellectually marginal or, by definition, isn't uh, economically marginal. It's the average level. Uh, so, 
So what they did was to put together a program of child rearing and family support that involved everything from tutorial programs from the age of six months onto the entry into school to visitors who would be mother's helpers to financial support payments that would allow families to buy the proper foods and of course the mother's helper support saw the proper foods were given to the children on proper schedules. Proper is a middle class term. It is a term that uh, was used here to define behavior that the researchers believed allowed one to survive in the American society and that's where these children lived in the American society. And the children were taken from one of the most economically disadvantaged census tracts in Milwaukee. And because it was an experiment, a control group was identified, a group of children was identified, it was split by a table of random numbers into two groups. One was the control group which simply identified and left alone. The other was the experimental group in which one performed the kind of intervention I've just described over a period of five years. And when you looked at the IQs of these children after five years, you saw the data that's presented on the next slide. And the numbers of individuals here are large. We're talking about groups in excess of 100 in the control and in the experimental group, 100 individuals. And we're talking about a period of five years. And this data has been published. In the case of the, experim of the experimental group that received this intervention, there was a very rapid climb up to an average IQ, somewhere in the neighborhood of 115 to 120, and that gain has been maintained now through the first year of school. In the control group, uh, that group has an average IQ around 90, 85 to 90, uh, the average IQ that one finds typically in the black population of the United States. We can have the lights again, please. What this data says added to the data produced by Sandra Scar Salopatic added to the studies of socioeconomic status that I cited from Paul Nichols is that the environment, not surprisingly, can have a powerful effect on intellectual development. This really shouldn't be a terribly surprising finding. And in fact, in the absence of the strong stand taken by Professor Jensen and Professor Shockley, it wouldn't even be all that scientifically interesting because it's the kind of thing that common sense would tell most people. But in the case of a situation like this, it's very nice to have your common sense buttressed by statistically valid data from a number of different investigators using a number of different experimental protocols. Now, that essentially concludes the presentation on three facets of genetics that I wanted to present tonight. It tells you something about what's being done by molecular geneticists in uh, recombinant DNA work. It tells you a little about the possibilities offered by the cloning of organisms. And it tells you something about the race IQ argument. My personal feeling is that such a discussion isn't a discussion until it is a discussion. So what I would like very much to do now, if I may, with the approval of the chairman of the meeting, what I'd like very much to do now is to open it up to discussion and to give people an opportunity to air some of their own views on any or all of these matters that I've aired this evening. Please. Yes. As you know, IQ tests at an early age are determined by what a child can do as opposed to what, the, what most children at that age can do. You get a, a mental age and a chronological age, you divide the mental age by the chronological age, and you get an IQ from that number. Now, it's true that IQs measured at ages of one or one and a half or two tend to bounce around a great deal. They're not very reliable figures. So one doesn't take an IQ measured at 12 months or 18 months nearly so seriously as one takes an IQ measured at four years or five years. The thing that gives you some confidence in IQ test measurement at four years or five years is that if you get people, quotation marks, skilled in the art, and you get two of them, and you give that, those two people one youngster, 
and one tests the youngster on Thursday and another tests the youngster a week later, the next Thursday, uh, they can duplicate their scores within plus or minus five points. Okay? The validity of the test comes to some extent from its replicability. Okay? All right. Yes. Yes. In some motor skills for a period of time, not in all motor skills. But okay. Say, yeah. People people who have looked at this question have reported that on those motor tests that they used that there appear to be a brief period of time when black youngsters seem to be ahead of white youngsters. That's true. Uh, the deficit doesn't last for a very long period of time, for a brief period of time, for the motor tests that have been used. Yes, that is what's been found. However, remember I did add the caveat that IQ tests at age 12 months or 18 months or 24 months aren't to be taken too seriously because the replicability isn't good. They bounce around a great deal. Okay, so we're not going to make a strong, strong case on the basis of the 12-month scores. The thing that's going to interest us uh, are going to be the scores made at three years, four years, five years, six years. Okay, and I don't think it can be gainsaid that if you take a random sample of people and divide them according to IQ test scores and then try to teach them something in a school, you're going to find you can teach people with high IQs more rapidly than you can teach people with low IQs. That doesn't mean that they're inherently superior. It doesn't mean they're better. It means that at the point at which, the time at which you give them the test, they, they will do better at school type tasks than other people will do. That's what the test is designed to show, and that's exactly what it shows. So it's circular argument. The person with a high IQ is the person with a score high IQ test. Yes, but now there are other things that come in too, and that is that there are correlations between how well you do in school up to a point and how well you do after school. If you don't finish school, you're not as likely to do well as someone who does finish. You're not as likely to. There's some people who don't never finish who do extremely well. There's people who finish all kinds of schools who don't do anything at all. But, you know, uh, on the average, people who finish school and learn how to do some things tend to do better economically than people who don't finish school and learn how to do some things. So there are some correlations involved here. It's not a totally meaningless number. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to save uh, Jody's howitzer for last <laughs> and uh, 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 go on to the gentleman from Iowa State in the blue sweater. I think I probably should study in 73, but even after 73, Shockley was still arguing statistically against that study. Yes. What is his present word on such studies? Well, we talk about this a great deal whenever we get together to have our little chats. <laughs> and uh, uh, he doesn't uh, confront the study to a great extent. Professor Shockley's main argument now is that we really don't know enough about this question and we ought to do a great deal more work on it. That's his main argument now, that his belief is that there is a genetic deficit, that his favorite studies, which precede those of Nichols and Salopatic and also Heber, and he will agree that they came before those. They're not the last word, they're the prior word, but he likes them better and believes them more devoutly than I do, and he likes those. And he thinks there ought to be a lot more money and a lot more research done in this area. My argument to that is that it's a question of priorities and that any individual, Professor Shockley, Professor Jensen, ought to be able to study whatever they choose to study, however they want to. I just don't want my tax dollars supporting that before they support as much as possible the more basic questions of psychology that have to do with learning, that have to do with brain development, that have to do with the functioning of the higher nervous system. I'm struck by the fact that nobody, nobody, even at Iowa State, even has a good idea, a good hypothesis of how a higher nervous system works. So my feeling is that our research dollars ought to go into far more fundamental and basic questions of that sort. And after we have funded that kind of work, to saturate data, let me rehearse the data that was in the Jensen paper. Um, <clears throat> and let's talk about that situation. 
If you look at the IQ scores of the Indians cited by Professor Jensen, and he didn't cite data for all, and he cited for a particular group of Indians, uh, their IQs were seven points lower on the average than the IQs of American whites. But they were seven points higher, or seven or eight points higher than the IQs of American blacks. And of course, the kind of argument that you had always heard before Jensen, Professor Jensen published this information was that, well, blacks score a low on IQ test because there are not many books in the home. Well, the obvious answer to that is there are not many books in the TP either. And look at that. <laughs> what are you going to do about that? Um, well, one of the things you do is you look to see what kind of culture the Indians have and what kind of culture the blacks have. And you find there are sharp cultural differences between blacks and Indians. Their, their child rearing practices are very different. You also find that Indians, when they go to school, tend to go to school with whites. The data that, that Jensen cited was for Indians who primarily went to white schools. The data from blacks comes from, in, from blacks who went to black schools. And I don't argue that school integration is the whole answer, but a real sort of integration of cultures is perhaps important. But then when you look at the data more carefully, you find it has an awful lot of structure in it. Uh, anybody who sat on admissions committees for universities and colleges around the country uh, has noticed that if you look at the data gathered randomly from Indian applicants, that the scores are so low as to be almost meaningless. They're lower to admissions committees and even black scores turn out to be. And of course the reason is that little running bear who's applying hasn't gone to school through most of his life. So you're not surprised that on the SAT he does nothing at all. If you don't do, no if you don't do anything on the SAT, you're not going to do very much on the IQ test either. They're, very, they're, they're, they're nicely correlated in terms of the kind of scores you make. Um, the other thing you find is in Dr. Sandra Scar Salopatic's study on transracial adoptions is that the group that scored highest in transracial adoptions were whites. And when you adopt white children into white families, you find their IQs go up to an average into upper middle class white families. You find their IQs go up to about 115 or 116. You find that blacks who had one white parent and one black parent go up to 111. You find blacks who had two black parents only go up to 106. And you find that Indians are lowest and the next lowest group, they don't go up any higher than 100. And you find the next lowest group are Asians, who don't go up very much at all. And you say, my, that's strange, isn't it? And then you look at the data very carefully, and what you find is that babies are color-coded. And uh, there is an unconscious aesthetic judgment made in deciding what child you're going to adopt. And it turns out that the children who get adopted most quickly are white children. Children who get adopted next most quickly are children who aren't quite white, but look kind of white. One black parent, one white parent. You find the next most quickly adopted children are Asian and Indian children. In other words, they're the last ones to be adopted. Okay, even black children get adopted before American Indian and Asian American children get adopted. And so you find that if you look at Sandra Scar Salopatic's data, and I'll just bore you with some of it here, you find that for children who had uh, two black parents, for instance, the average age at adoption was 32 months. Children who had one black parent, the average age at adoption was I read some studies about a year ago by um, what did God say about Poles? Dumb. Well, I read one, some studies by a, a dumb Polish psychologist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, at the University of Chicago is in design. Studies that show poor, very good and clear correlation over 15 IQ points of birth order and performance on IQ. Yes, okay. yes. Right. Yes, yes. Okay. Please cite it, though, Jody, if you would. Yeah, yeah. all right. Well, yeah. apparently, um, you know, if you are the first child of two, you do better on your IQ test than if you're the second child. And if you're the second, the third child of three, you do worse than the second child of two, and so on down to you're the ninth child. Um, it turns out, and these, these are random, uh, random families that were picked for this. It turns out that if you take these data on IQ performance and family size and birth order in the family, that uh, and apply this to census statistics about black families, that is uh, using like six percent of um, some. Well, I don't remember the exact statistics now. I'm not really up on it. But in black families, there's a larger percentage of families. With Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, it apparently are quite good studies for this concern. 
Jody, I wish you would comment on yeah, <laughs> a dumb poll. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I wish you would like Chopin. I wish you would comment on the. Uh, I wish you would comment on the recombinant DNA story because I presented a very one-sided view of that, yeah. and I do wish you would uh, you would comment on that. Well, I was <coughs> hoping I'd be with you on the other side of the fence, right? But the thing is, I am not too much in disagreement with you. There's one thing that concerns me about this: is that all of our chromosomes have embedded in them viral genes, and that when you go around slicing up chromosomes with these fancy enzymes, I'm afraid that when you do a good deal of slicing of uh, higher organism chromosomes, that you will be, in fact, uh, inducing these viral genes, which I would not like to, to see in a bacterial species, you know, because they're uh, viruses which uh, both invade and are very uh, cancer producing for man. You know, that's a yeah. reservation that I feel very strongly about. I do want to add the reservation that I think that it's very good that the furor has been raised about this kind of research because it's forced in a way nothing else would. It's forced people who are doing this kind of work to examine very carefully their security precautions, to institute security precautions which otherwise wouldn't have been instituted, and now we're going to have some real monitoring of this kind of work that wouldn't have gone on otherwise. So the public protest has had a salutary effect on the safe conduct of these, the safer conduct of these experiments. I don't think their safety is guaranteed, but they'll be safer under these conditions. Other questions, please. Uh, question here, then here. Yes. Five groups involved in this research and common DNA is controlled by the federal government. I, I think it's, it's a very serious matter right now because this recombinant DNA interacted with E. coli and it's supposed to be going in isolated chambers or whatever like that. And something like that can get loose and like E. coli is the basic bacteria of your uh, intestinal lining. I'm not sure everybody heard your remarks. Let me just summarize, and then Jody, why don't you make a comment, and I'll comment on it also. Uh, did everyone hear, hear the remarks made? Uh, let me summarize them. If my paraphrase is inaccurate, please correct me. Uh, you said essentially that you think the choice of, org of organism for recombinant DNA is very bad, in that it's Escherichia coli, something that inhabits all of our intestines, that it's a poor choice of organism in which to do recombinant DNA research because it's something that, in a natural way, inhabits the intestine of human beings, and so you're doing uh, genetic manipulations that may be potentially dangerous on an organism that in a very natural way tends to live in the gut of human beings. And your feeling is that this research is conducted in secret in a number of places, that people don't talk about their research, cor correct? Right, and I mean, they're not more or less publicized to the general public. Like, it's published in scientific journals or whatever like that, but the ordinary person that's really writing about You know, correlate with each other as far as being uh, potentially dangerous to society as a whole. Okay, and your further point is that it's not 
uh, communicated to the, it's not really carried on in secret, but it's not communicated in any place but in scientific journals primarily, and it's not communicated to the public in general. I just make a couple of brief comments, and then I hope uh, uh, Dr. Stadler will have some remarks to make about this. And the two brief comments I'd make are, first of all, I agree with you that they could have chosen a better organism, and the strains of E. coli they used have been weakened in all kinds of genetic ways in such a way that they're they're, they are laboratory creatures and would be very crippled for living in the wild. They're always possible they may revert or may take hold or may transfer their plasmids to healthy E. coli bacteria if they got out. The other part, though, I think I would disagree with. I'd say that probably if you picked up your Des Moines Register and found an account of David Baltimore's later experiment, you would call the publisher of the paper and say, what is this you're publishing? I want to read a newspaper in English, not in scientific gibberish. Uh, probably the general public doesn't want to read the accounts of this research. And I would argue that probably the people doing the research, as opposed to being secretive, as soon as they get something big done, want to get up on top of a building and take a bullhorn and announce that they have done it so they will be famous and get Nobel Prizes. So I, I wouldn't say that they're being secretive about it, quite the contrary, they're being very competitive about it. I would, I would argue that no one can say that this research must end in disaster. Anybody who says it must end in disaster, I think is overstepping the facts. Just as anybody who says it's absolutely safe is overstepping the facts. You know, people have bred Doberman Pinschers that have killed people. Well, still, the only people that have benefited from this particular breeding would be... A man named Paul Berg was one of the people most instrumental in calling together a group of scientists who were involved in recombinant DNA research at Asilomar, at Pacific Grove in California, a very lovely spot near Monterey where the monarch butterflies like to migrate each year. And um, the purpose of this meeting was to get people together who were working in this area to discuss the potential biohazards of this kind of research and to push for drawing up guidelines not to make the work absolutely safe, because anybody who says they can guarantee anything new that they do will be safe is lying to you or a fool, okay? But to at least draw up guidelines that would bring the research under greater control, that would increase the safety factors under which this research was done. There were people who felt that, uh, as Erwin Chargaff has put it, this is an example of having the asylum run by the inmates to have the people doing the work draw up the guidelines and make the suggestions that they have a lot of access to grind and they're not the best people to make the suggestions. So when the National Institutes of Health looked at this matter, the director, Donald Fredrickson, this was at a subsequent meeting held last April, the director, Donald Fredrickson, had uh, a federal judge from the Washington area, a man who was known for his astuteness in dealing with social policy questions, also come and sit and give advice on what was going on and some of the advice that was given by this gentleman, uh, to sum it up, was essentially that this is a matter much too important to be left solely to scientists, that uh, whatever guidelines you come up with and whatever procedures you come up with, you ought to document in great detail, so there is a record of why you made certain decisions and what your justifications would be, and that one ought to proceed with utmost caution here, and one of the models for the ways to proceed would come from our experience with uh, the atom. Okay, that it was, a, it was a potentially hazardous area and we ought to be very careful about the way we proceeded. And that's what's being done now. So there's a lot of public regulation of what's going on and there will be more. Yeah. Please. Augustine. I think that, first of all, uh, if we're going to be at all credible, we have to tell it like it is. We have to tell the data as it exists. Essentially, every study that's been done where you select people randomly and give them IQ tests, if you select one group of blacks randomly, another group of whites randomly, give an IQ test, in more than 1,000 different studies, 15 to 20 point differences have shown up. So I don't really think that's something you argue about. The question is, why is the difference there? Is the difference there because it's also not arguable that blacks and whites 
have uniquely different backgrounds as peoples in the United States and for that matter in the world. That's not arguable either. Okay, that, you, would, you would agree with that. Now the question is, why does the difference exist? If the difference exists for environmental reasons, what we need to do is correct the environment. If the difference, and you, you could see ways of doing that, uh, steps you might take, things you might try. If the difference exists because the DNA sequences are wrong, then it's going to take quite a bit of doing to correct that. The question is, is the difference caused for genetic reasons, and hence they are mutable only with great difficulty, or are they caused through environmental uh, factors which one might seek out and change? And the three studies I presented, the ones by Sandra Scarsalopatic, the study by um, Paul Nichols, and the study by Heber's group, and the studies that Jody cited by the dumb poll at the University of Chicago who has all these brilliant ideas about birth order, are just four studies that would argue that environment accounts for a lot of that difference, if not for all of it. So I think w we can't pretend that there aren't any differences educationally or in achievements that between blacks, whites, and whites, because there are differences between blacks and whites. The median income of whites is higher. Educational achievement is higher. Scores on SAT scores, higher. Scores on IQ tests, higher. That's true. Now let's talk about why it's true. And let's isolate the factors that cause the difference and let's correct them. I, I, that would be my way of, of dealing with that particular situation. Well, it's very, it's very interesting just to hear the comments from you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's another reason that this happened that you heard and then I can go and read about that. But I think that just saying it isolated without giving other data, you know, can cause people then to go off on their own little tangent and they can reinforce their, their, their opinion. I think you're absolutely right, and that's why I always present additional data. I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I agree. You had a question. Please. Yes, it was um, concerning, as I understood that you said that um, the IQ test is affected by the environment, basically, and the cultures. You're saying that people are affected by their cultures. Uh, what I would say if you ask me, do genes make